Um, thank you for coming along tonight. Um, I hope I can put in context where the guidance sits in the overall um, advisory process that's going on down here, which has turned into quite a big industry. And it would be useful if we could um, perhaps put it in its place quite accurately. So first up, um, what we're going to cover is the regulatory environment. And then I'm going to introduce a little bit about what the guidance is about, the technical categories. We'll look at some of the decision criteria that are in the MB document and its relationship perhaps to properties that are being processed at the moment. And then um, we'll go on and I'll show you a couple of slides around where we can go for information further down the track. The last two topics we won't cover tonight because unfortunately the engineer who was going to talk is off sick and so that will need to be left for another occasion. So moving on. The first thing I wanted to show you was this diagram that we, we use pretty widely for uh, the training of building officials. Basically it, what it shows is that the law is the building act and the building code. So the triangle at the top with the dotted line around it. The key feature for us today is that the guidance isn't sitting inside the triangle. So the guidance is not law, surprisingly. In the, if, in the case of the guidance, it's informed by the law. So the, the Building Code and the Building Act, which are quite small documents, in total they're less than 100 pages, so something about that thick. And when you compare it with the guidance, which is a tome, a tome like that, plus some other questions and answers, you can see that it's been expanded quite significantly. So if we think about um, the guidance approach, you can go down the guidance approach. If you're using the guidance, it's been um, talked to councillors about, so it has a, there's been a conversation with council, and if you're using the guidance, the council will accept the solutions that are in the guidance relatively easily, and it speeds it through the consenting process. And of course, if a large number of people do that, it means the council's resources are well used because they can work efficiently against those designs. But it isn't the only method of getting to a solution. And that's an important thing that we're going to stress here. People can go down the blue side of the um, building process or building legislative process and produce their own solutions. Those solutions still need to pass the test of meeting the building code. And they would be through the council consenting process. The consent would look at, the consent staff would look at document and check whether it meets the building code. They're looking at the same thing that the MB guidance is pitching at on the other hand. So on that note, we'll move on. The guidance itself, it's a fairly chunky document. You wouldn't want to print it out, that's for sure. Um, it comes from section 175. So that's the authorizing um, document, the, the building act. Under section 175, MB issues a lot of guidance. Pretty much all the guidance that you see on our internet sites have been put out under section 175, which means they have the authority to be taken as read by councils as being authorised information. And people using that information can use it with councils and councils don't have to, they don't have to justify to councils why they've used the information. They can simply say it's come out of the 175 advice. So pretty tricky. The methods are not mandatory in the document, touched on that already. The, what we've tried to do with the guidance is provide something that shows the scale, the magnitude of what needs to be done and also provide some specifics so that people can take the specifics or they can use that to help determine the kind of level they're at. There are a number of foundation designs that have come along subsequent to the guidance in the private sector and they have become quite accepted as solutions because they are set around the same level, use the same performance criteria and so they've been able to get over the hurdle of being acceptable in the consent process. So the guidance um, is not absolute. The, all the guidance says is this is what we consider to be an appropriate solution here you may choose to do something more or less off the back of that, but it does generalise. You've obviously, if you put out the guidance, you can't deal with every single property, and pretty much every property is unique. So you can only use it as a guide. We can't possibly stamp it on sites when we don't really know what's happening on the sites. 
There are some common themes though. In, in the process, obviously, there are lots of houses that have settled. There are houses that have um, differentially settled. There are houses that have survived really well. There are foundations that have been good. We know of foundation designs that are better than others for performing. So we've been able to look at them in a semi-generalized way, but we can't come back to a general rule. The guidance doesn't define the insurance obligation. That's one of the key messages here. And we've been saying it since the day the guidance was issued. In the guidance, it says, this does not meet, necessarily meet the obligations of insurers. This is a, effectively a minimum target and your insurer, no doubt, will have a relationship with you that should be driving off that to that level or a greater level, depending on what your policy says in that area. So moving on, one of the key things in the technical guidance was the, was the decision to go to technical categories. After the first major earthquake, so before the February earthquake, a large number of very good engineers from around the country were brought together to look at the Canterbury situation post the first earthquake and decide how best to get the engineering done in the balance of the, the size. After the February earthquake, it became far more relevant because, in fact, there were a lot more properties damaged and it was even more useful to have it rationed going forward. Now, when I say rationed, the, the TC1... TC2, TC3 process was about get, working out the risks on the site. So if you're on a TC1 site, the chances are you'll be able to carry on with a standard building process. You'll be able to use 3604, which is the standard light building design code, and you won't need to make any special provisions for ground conditions because they're generally in line with sound ground conditions elsewhere in the country. Not really too much of a problem. If you're in TC2, well, the, the, the engineering group decided that actually there are, it's quite variable. Some of the properties will have some liquefaction risk, some maybe won't, but they need a little bit more attention going forward. So the guidance says, if you're in a TC2, here are some solutions that we think you should be looking at as you go forward. We haven't done that for TC1 because we didn't need to. By the time you get to TC3, though, we're starting to say, we're not actually quite sure where the liquefaction will go. We don't actually know how much liquefaction there will be. Um, we can't really tell what will be the performance of the land under this property. So we need to get an additional amount of review done. And you'll know in the guidance that it talks about shallow and deep geotechnical investigation. That's been predicated by the TC3 zoning. Now, why was this all important? If you think about little old New Zealand, there aren't that many geotech engineers. So if you want them to do, deal with every house in Canterbury, it's going to take a very, very long time to get through. But if you can narrow the requirement for them down to a relatively small component, you're able to actually get the, the resource focused where it's most needed. And that was one of the reasons why the guidance was put out, was to help push the right people onto the right side of the jobs because there's plenty of houses that need geotech investigation, let alone need the other attention that's needed in the process. So the objective was to um, work with the level of risk and adjust the amount of engineering that went into um, the rebuilding of houses and the repair of houses, determining the strategy and that sort of thing um, in that process. In the guidance, there are um, a number of objectives um, stated. I've praised them here. The guidance was very carefully worded because it's very hard to get a set of documents where everybody takes the same meaning from the words that you write. So these are very much praised. They're in much bigger form in the document itself. But the aim of the rebuild process was to put in place more resilient foundations. So you see those um, larger concrete foundations that are uh, providing for movement of the ground and rejacking of houses and all those sort of things. They're all part of trying to push back into place more appropriate um, to, to cope with future uh, resilient needs. The repairs based on good practice, we, we felt that we needed a, a benchmark on which we could base 
the um, repairs, because if you have absolutely nothing, there's nowhere really to start. So the guidance came out and said, in the event that you've got certain levels of um, displacement or, or damage, then you need to be taking some action at that point. And that's helped drive the actions in the right direction. It hasn't necessarily solved the problems, but it's helped drive the, the behavior. The emphasis on the ground conditions is really important in this document because it's not common in New Zealand and in a lot of other places to send the geotech in to look at the foundation before you build a house. Most houses are built on the basis that the ground's been there for a while and it all looks pretty good and we'll get on and we'll build the house on it. So what we've learned in Canterbury is that you can't take that for granted. And so there's a lot of work now going on both in Canterbury and in other parts of the country around how you might better use the geotechs to um, help get more information before you build so that you build appropriately when you go ahead. Surprising that we managed to get into 2015 um, before we managed to get to that point. Okay, so the Building Act and the Building Code requirements. If you use the guidance, you're going to meet those requir the requirements of the Building Code and the Building Act, which is in itself is a great milestone because it helps you get through the consenting process. If you do anything better than that, obviously you can be reasonably confident that you're going to be able to push that through the council as well, if it's a council exercise. It's also been useful in terms of the exempted work, which is a large part of the work that's been done in actually pushing the level of performance up rather than letting people just decide one way or the other where they would go in that process. The common understanding of assessment, and repair and rebuild, we did, didn't want to end up with different practitioners delivering different solutions across the, the, the worst of the ground because they all need to at least be at a certain level of performance. So in the terms of the whole building stock, you've got yourself going forward rather than having good houses, bad houses, um, all mixed together. So the audience for the, for the process was definitely technical. We were looking to the engineers to drive them in the particular direction. The building consent people, we got involved so that they could see what was being put through so that when you got the information across the desk to them, it was familiar and that they were happy with it. And the insurance sector and the PMOs, where we've been trying to make them lift their game and, and produce at the level that we think is the least level that you could perform and have a house um, at standard. So this is just a quick um, diagram out of the, the um, document. You can see on the left hand side there's all the uniform ground underneath the houses. Um, that's kind of TC1 land. If you look in the next section there's a, a sort of a lens of darker ground which would be the liquefied ground at, at depth which might be TC2 land. And then over at the very right hand side, because of the influences of a free surface like the edge of a river or the edge of the sea or um, other things, and the, the fact that the liquefaction layer is quite thick, generates what would be a TC3 performance. So that's kind of what we see. OK, so um, in the document, there are a whole lot of decisions to be made. On the right hand side, there's a flow chart. You won't be able to read it, but I, I just put it in to illustrate that in the guidance, there's a whole lot of places where logic is being applied. If you've got this issue, then you've got that. If you've not got that issue, then you've got this. And it takes you down a path which leads to some sort of outcome at the bottom, which um, meant that decisions could be made in a uniform way. There are about 12 or 13 of these flow diagrams in the document, and they deal with different parts of it, but it helps people see the written material in a different form. So the criteria um, that we've looked at, the strongest criteria that we've got is the differential settlement um, criteria, where we've, we've set 100 millimeters over the, the width of a house um, as the base for uh, looking at lifting doesn't mean that that has to be beyond that before you would lift a house to level. That's what we're saying is the minimum standard and we would expect it to trigger people thinking really hard. I wouldn't think you'd want to leave something much more pitched than that. 
In the case of the cumulative crack criteria, again, it's, it's been put in there because it helps us define what the existing foundation has done. If the, if the foundation is, is broken with a large number of very large cracks, we know that it will have done something to the structure of the house because it stands to reason if the end walls of the house are still on the foundation, but the foundation is extended by, say, 50 millimetres, something must have given in between in the superstructure. So looking at the foundation, you can tell quite a lot about the house itself. It also means that you can see what the behaviour was against the ground. And the, and the theory is that if you've had very little cracking in the foundation, it tends to suggest that in the next event, you would also have very little cracking because the performance is a very good indicator of where you would go next time. And that means that you wouldn't go to doing anything radical with the foundation and you might just go to a modest repair. If the cracks have got quite large, then you, or a piece of the wall has fallen out, then you know that you've got a much bigger issue. It isn't performing even under current conditions and it needs more significant repair, replacement of the broken bit or further work in the foundation. And that's all kind of set out in the guidance. We've put a kind of a 30% percentage on the amount of broken ground before you should start thinking about the whole foundation. But it doesn't mean that if 50% of the foundation is damaged, you need to replace the whole foundation. What it means is it's a pointer to having a more closer look at the damage that's occurred. And if it's over 30, it's starting to get significant. And so you need to think about whether the same, putting back the same would be as good as doing something better with it going forward. So cumulative cracks are quite important as an indicator. The liquefaction criteria is around um, knowing how much liquefaction there's been around the property. If, if it's been very significant amount of liquefaction, that tends to indicate that the foundation needs to be very robust. And so you might apply harder criteria in terms of the replacement process than you would where there's no liquefaction. It might also be the, the breaker that makes the change between doing a repair on a foundation and perhaps replacing a foundation. There are, there's no absolute line in here, but it, what it does is it points to the factors that need to be considered in the process. So it's not just the criteria, but the scale of the criteria. If, the, if you've got a little bit of liquefaction, that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as if you've got a lot of cracking and no liquefaction, for example. But it might be that in a particular location, the houses next door are also performing the same way, so you can see there's something more happening on the ground, even though you haven't got liquefaction boiling around the house. Um, and so that might lead to a decision to do more work or less work um, going forward. If there's a lot of liquefaction around the house, it's obviously leaning in the other direction, and it's saying these foundations are going to need much more attention in order to sort them going forward. Okay, so the guy is split between TC2 and TC3. I said why we didn't use TC1. The TC2 and the TC3, separate chapters, because we're treating the houses completely different in those two zones, because in TC2, something close to current design practice is pretty good, but in TC3, it needed some special treatment, and so the special treatment's been isolated out um, in that area. Repairing and rebuilding methodology. The guidance on foundations um, is about uh, future risk. So we look at the house and saying it's performed really well now. We don't need to do too much because it'll perform really well next time or it hasn't performed particularly well now. We should do something about um, bringing it up to what we think is current standard practice. There are loading requirements, ground bearing pressures, things like that, which help lead you in that particular direction. There are examples of the TC2 and TC3 foundations because that will drive behaviour around thinking about relevelability when you've got a TC3 house, thinking about um, how you might uh, insulate the house from further movement uh, going forward. The guidance on superstructure is uh, limited because generally above the slab level we would expect people to be using normal building design processes so there's not much point in putting special guidance in where you don't need it um, but we have addressed some of the issues the chimneys and the heavy roofs there's guidance in there about replacing chimneys and what would be a suitable lightweight design for a replacement chimney there are, there's 
advice in there about taking heavy roofs off. And usually you can see the houses where that's needed because the house is well and truly settled, um, particularly around the ring beam in a type two foundation. If that's gone down quite a long way and the center of the house hasn't, then you know you've got a weight problem um, that needs serious attention. The heavy veneers are in the same boat. If there's an opportunity to go to light veneers, there are recommendations in the guidance document um, on the circumstances where that should be done. That's not necessarily something that your insurance company would do because they may consider it betterment, but it is a significant um, form in, uh, um, issue in uh, performance, and so it's something that should be considered um, for a number of properties. Now, I've put plan shape up there because that's not generally known about, but we do have guidance around the regular shape of a house. A rectangular house performs much better than a house that sticks out in all directions because the external parts of it obviously get whipped around a bit. So in the guidance we've put in for footprints for houses that uh, ratios should be used when you're wanting to extend a little bit out here or a little bit out there. You must make the extension twice as long as it is wide or there's, there's factors in there. There's a considerable amount of scope um, for extra bits on the house but the ratios are kind of set to try and hold the level at which the house would perform so that bits on the edges don't accelerate more than the bits in the middle. Um, and, and that's been very useful for some of the architects going forward. So ground conditions and foundations, we're not going to cover that today. It's a huge topic. I'm sure there'll be a session on that um, in the not too distant future. And we, there is, it's well worth getting into that because the lesson that we've learnt is if you don't understand what's happening in the ground, you'll never get the house on top of it right. You've got to do that groundwork. The Geotech database is a, something that I wanted to talk about. It's not in the public arena because it's a new initiative that was put together in Canterbury by the Geotech engineers. They have all contributed their um, intellectual property in the form of their results from the testing that they've done around um, Canterbury into one common database. So now everybody who's working in the geotech space who contributes to the database can use the information that's sitting in the database. And it's led to a very large understanding about the performance in um, Canterbury. Why is this important? Well, nowadays the, the geotech can take an address and they can take 10 minutes to look at all the information that's available in the local vicinity around a property and they can form a view about whether they need more testing because they don't have enough to understand the site or they can form a view off the adjacent piece of information. That means that they put A, less time in, but B, they use their time to provide advice on what is required for the foundation instead of searching for information um, in order to formulate some advice and it's been a major success out of Canterbury and it's being nationalized um, going forward it's been found to be so successful so that's what the geotech database looks like you won't be able to count the number of points on there because there's somewhere in the region of 40,000 in the Canterbury area the graphs on the side show that the upload is standing at 40,000 and that the um, downloads are running at 800,000. So at Geotech people have been in there 800,000 times since the database was set up. It's been running for a couple of years now. Um, and as I say, that's about to be nationalized. Okay, we keep the guidance up to date. Um, we've been working uh, pretty much with industry all across Canterbury to make sure that we keep ahead of the issues that are being raised by engineers. So there are about 60 technical questions, we call them Q&As, um, that we've published, which form part of the guidance. So they're issued in the same um, legal framework as the guidance itself. And they bring up to date various issues, um, which eventually get incorporated into the full guidance. There's also guidance on uh, multi-units where we've particularly concentrated on the firewalls between properties because they've been a serious performance factor, um, but there's good advice in there. And there are others that relate to specialist areas like the seismic design of 
um, walls which, which are retaining land on the Port Hills. Then there's the Port Hills Mass Movement Zone and there's some pile design work also being put out. Um, as the new information comes available, we're ready to add it into the document. Most recently, we've had the information come through from the EQC trial, ground improvement trials, and we've used that information to produce a new section which went into the document was published on our news site about a month ago, and it's being incorporated this week into the total document itself. So it's really a useful um, uh, document for engineers. We keep it really current, and it keeps it in front of them that we've got a standard that has to be met as a minimum. Now, it's not the only show in town. The guidance is not mandatory, remember? So anybody else can come up with something that works. As long as they can get it consented, then it will, will, and that will be the test, then they'll be able to use that as well. I've just put up um, a short, uh, at least three websites anyway. The first one is to the Canterbury document, the one I waved around earlier. The second one um, is for the Build Back Smarter, which I just was asked to mention which is a, a program that is run from the Canterbury, uh, from the City Council, and it is an advisory service that's free to come into your home and give you advice on energy-related matters. So they'll cover insulation options, double glazing, uh, lighting, and give you a report which suggests which bit should be done first and how you can, can optimise um, your energy use into the future if you're in a position to make changes to the property. The third one is a document that's just been issued by MB, which relates to new building work. It, it's a document that describes the good and the bad and it draws a line at the point where we think that it's good enough to keep and, and anything you see below that is too bad. I stress that it relates to new building work because older houses have already moved. Some of them are just you know, even just a little bit out of line. It's just a matter of fact of life that houses don't stay exactly as they're built in the first instance. So you have to treat that with caution in an existing property, but it does provide a standard for the front end. Now, whilst we're talking about um, not being the only show in town, I know that John wanted to just say a couple of words um, in relation to warranties. Um, <clears throat> I just want to make everyone aware, first of all, my name's John Goddard, I'm supervising solicitor of the Residential Advisory Service. I wanted to make everyone aware of warranties that are in the Building Act which protect consumers and homeowners, even if you're not a party to a building contract, they apply and they include things like um, all building materials must be new, all building work must comply with plans, specifications and building consents, all building work must be carried out in a reasonably competent manner and there are a number of other warranties as well which are enforceable and do provide consumers with remedies. and. Um, is definitely aware, becoming aware of those. Thank you. And that takes me down to the um, last slide, which is um, any questions. Thank you.